So let's talk about the economy for just a minute. This is the position of what has happened over the last sort of, I guess, 10 or so years in New Zealand. So we've built up a lot of debt, and it's primarily not at the government level, it's actually at what's called the private sector. So it's mum and dad right across New Zealand, businesses, farms, the whole nine yards. We owe lots of money. Um, so much so that we owe 85% of it to foreigners. So we owe 85% of our economy and the overwhelming bulk of it is to foreigners. So no OECD country, so there are the 30 countries in the world that are developed economies, no country in the world borrows a bigger percentage of their money from foreigners than New Zealand. John Penny Bright, I hope to be seeing you in Parliament after the Bosnian by-election. Oh, good. Um, regard... I won't wish you luck, because Jamie Lee Ross is our guy, and I think we'll do a fabulous job, but you know, we like democracy, though. Regarding a grown-up conversation about debt, yeah. Prime Minister, on the 26th of January, I sent you an Official Information Act request asking, on a line-by-line -line accounting basis, could you please provide the detailed information which shows exactly to whom New Zealand has become indebted since National Act Government came to power in November 2008. And I asked in particular the information which confirms whether or not New Zealand has become indebted to the Bank of America, any subsidiaries of the Bank of America, or any lending institutions of any form which have connections to the Bank of America. I have yet to have an acknowledgement to this request. The reason why I'm asking, Prime Minister, is because according to the Register of Pecuniary Interests, you are a shareholder in the Bank of America, and are you personally profiting from New Zealand's growing indebtedness? And when will I get an answer to my question? Uh, no, I'm not. So you get an answer in June, of course, that comes from, from uh, you know, those people who put that together. I wouldn't have a clue whether they borrowed any money off them. If they would, they do it at commercial rates. And the reason I'm a shareholder of Bank of America is because I was a very long-term shareholder of Merrill Lynch. When I was at the company, it was very well run, but unfortunately when I left, it wasn't, and Bank of America bought them when they went broke. Penny Bright, who's our next submitter. A supporters wish to fill her appearance before the committee. Does the committee give leave for this to occur during the share? No. What's it to use? What's it to be used for? Uh, upload uh, to YouTube for uh, viewing by the public. This is an open meeting, no. for goodness sake. Only if you get our best side. There are no objections. I'd just like you to check that the light is OK. We have computer programs that can tweak it, so we'll make all the uh, prestigious people here nice and pretty. I don't wish to appear purple. <laughs> <laughs> We are running to a tight schedule for the game from 9 in the morning till 9 at night. If you could leave us 5 minutes of your 15, we'd be grateful so we can engage in discussion with you. Or you can use it all up. The choice is yours. But we'll listen avidly. Local Government Act 2002 Amendment Bill is dealing with transparency. I have yet to see anything that is going to make it a mandatory requirement for details of contracts issued to be published in council annual reports. Details of the name of the contracting company, the value of the contract, the term of the contract and the scope of the contract are available for public scrutiny. The New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption, they found that there were more complaints about corruption in local government than, other, than any other area and the majority of the complaints against local government corruption were to do with contracting and procurement. One of their key corruption resistant questions that they asked councils was, do you publish details of contracts issued in council annual reports so they are available for public scrutiny? We can find pages and pages of tiny, minute detail on ministerial credit cards, but we do not know where hundreds of millions of dollars of public money are being spent on contracts. When I petitioned Parliament after using myself as bait and, and refusing to pay my Auckland City Council rates on exactly this issue, but you'll be pleased to know that you can now find that information on Auckland City Council website. But I do expect to see that in the legislation. It's long time overdue and it should be there. Totally opposed to sections 31 and 32, future privatisation of water through long-term water contracts and we believe they should be struck out. The income stream from publicly owned water services infrastructure ending up in the hands of particularly multinational 
water companies. A petition calling for a full inquiry into the seven existing United Water contracts in New Zealand. Anything to do with these United Water contracts, it's extremely smelly, like the way the whole process was railroaded through in, in Papakura over Christmas time in 1997. Basically it was not done in a, in a commercially sound way. You claim you're going to return the asset in a better state than when you got it, and surely you'd want to quantify the state of the asset in the first place. That was never done. The ex-Mayor of Papakura, David Hawkins, ended up being appointed by Mark Ford ended up as the commercial corporate liaison manager for water care and given that background, corrupt practices <coughs> in actual fact, this legislation, how it has been drafted, who's been involved, groups like the New Zealand Council for Infrastructural Development represent big snouts lining up to get into these public private partnership contracts. It seems that policy analysts are very slanted in terms of where they go for consultation. Mm. Bodies that have a direct financial interest in the outcome of the legislation are treated as independent third parties because that's what happened. Mm. And I put it to you that we are rather a major stakeholder as either ratepayers or, or, or taxpayers and we seem to be shunted right out. You're right here now. Or oh, I'm here now. They are not doing things in a proper and transparent way. If you've got people that have a vested financial interest, if they're being treated as independent, local government New Zealand, claiming to represent the views of 85 district, city and regional councils all over New Zealand, that body supports 35-year contracts. Who sponsored local government New Zealand's annual conference they just had were a number of those same big companies that could financially benefit from this legislation. Solgum, who represent the CEOs of the council, if you look on their website, they have a family of sponsors. And again, some of these same <coughs> companies who could will financially benefit are, are, are directly sponsoring these bodies. Very dodgy. Excellent suggestion. I've certainly noted it, and I'm sure it will be subject to the discussion later on. Who didn't have a question as such? Well, <laughs> yeah. Is it your view that you need a legislative um, requirement there to ensure that information is collated in one place? by the annual report, or would it be enough for the public to act effectively as public watchdogs in their own right? Because when you have that combined with the fact that there is no statutory requirement for a register of interest for politicians at local government level, so what are the connections between those who give the contracts and those who get the contracts? How do we know? Because at the moment we have to rely on the individual integrity of councillors to stand on their hind legs and declare a conflict of interest. That Again, I'd ask you to moderate your vocabulary. Mr Chair, I think there's a legitimate yeah. political debate. Yeah. There are freedom of speech yeah. principles that are really yeah, highly yeah. what, what it would require is a change to the Local Members Interest Act 1968, which the Office of the Auditor General recognised as hope, hopelessly out of date. From my experience, haven't had much luck with the statutory third party public watchdogs and seem to have had a lot more effect as a, as a public watchdog with, without a statutory tooth in my head but gums very sharp. DPPs are likely to only be used by a few undercapitalised rural councils. That is where central government could play a role and if you've got small communities that don't have a big rating base or whatever, there should be assistance from central government, like public-public partnerships, in order to get that infrastructure that is required. But mind you, of course, if we got rid of cut out heaps of private contractors across the whole sector, a lot of these piggies in the middle, I'm sure it would free up hundreds of millions of dollars. These provisions wouldn't be used by the big metropolitan council. I don't buy that. Once the legislation is there, it can be used. There's never been any cost-benefit analysis for any CCO model, and it goes CCO, then PPP, that's the alphabet soup. Same with public-private partnerships. Where is the cold, hard evidence that this model actually serves the interests of the public majority? Who are the companies that sponsor the local government conference that you believe could financially benefit? A, a backgrounder here that actually has that... Secondly, I had, yes, a, I had um, another question, which was you talked about you know, that, that basically we would open up and these multinational corporations would come yeah. in. Why do you think they would be 
multinational corporations rather well, than well, a New Zealand because, one? Because right now we have um, <coughs> United Water, which is 100% owned by Veolia, which is the biggest yeah. French water multinational company in the world. Yeah. It has um, a franchise in Papakura, been there since 1997, and is also in Franklin. So it's snuck in there in Franklin. And what really concerns me that right now as we speak, the program manager responsible <coughs> for leading the integration of Auckland <coughs> Regional Water Services at the ATA is a Mr Graham Wood, who was a previous managing director of United Water South Australia. And I have not spoken to one councillor in the Auckland region that was aware of his private sector background, and I think that is a disgrace. It is another form, in my view, of a corrupt practice. All of this can be done without um, any special consultation or consulting the people of well, New that, Zealand. Well, that obviously just makes it worse. Thank you. The War on News and Citizen A. I appear on Radio New Zealand's The Panel, TV3's <coughs> The Nation, and TVNZ's Q&A. My involvement in students' associations came through my writing as a poet and going on to writing arts reviews and editing the Auckland University student magazine Crackham, I experienced what the student movement offers, not just to its members in the form of representation, services and advocacy, but in its contribution to the media and to the arts. My career in the media is possible because of the experience I gained working in student media, and that is true for a large contingent of broadcasters working today. It's also true for musicians who established their careers playing orientation gigs, actors who performed in student plays, and a huge range of others working in creative industries. This bill threatens to undermine the work that student associations do, which enriches New Zealand culturally by pooling resources. Student associations create a variety of different spaces where artists and journalists can learn and experiment, and with some great results. Those of us working in the media, stimulating debate around political issues and encouraging critical thinking and political participation are also helping to make our democracy better. Student associations have made a vital contribution to that work. This bill would bring about, in my thinking, a series of disastrous results and it would be foolish to discount the negative effects on the arts and media all because a few ACT Party members are opposed to any kind of collectivism. I understand some members have been concerned about the impact on sports teams. I'm concerned with the impact on the arts and politics. All of these things benefit from compulsory student unionism. For those with real ideological issues with collective representation, they have always had the ability to argue their case and opt out of being a union member. So the gains caused by abolishing the perceived human rights abuse of compulsory student unionism, in my mind, certainly doesn't add up. I don't wish to be cynical, <laughs> but it seems the pointless crushing of the student <coughs> union movement is more an ideological patsy for Sir Roger Douglas to stop talking about flat tax. <laughs> that in itself is a foolish suggestion as we know nothing could stop Sir Roger Douglas talking about flat tax. Thanks to the recession caused by Sir Roger's mentor, Milton Friedman, and his neoliberal agenda, I was back on campus this year, continuing papers towards my MA in politics, and I can attest that a yogurt has more of an active culture in the Auckland campus today. Student unionism creates a hot house for sports, politics, and arts. Shutting it down because of ideological vanity is unnecessary political vandalism. I thank the committee for allowing me the opportunity to express my opinion on this issue. As a political commentator, would you agree that this bill will be seen as a bit of a smokescreen, diverting attention from all the other fundamental changes that the institution and the at the moment? I think it's more a, a thank you to Sir Roger for his tireless uh, help on the neoliberal agenda for such a long time. The majority of uh, those people who you recognise in the media today have all in some way during the university careers been active in student media, John Campbell, Mark Sainsbury, uh, I think even Paul Henry may have uh, written a couple of columns here and there. Uh, most of them have actually been active in their time at university. What student media I think has always been allowed uh, people to do is experiment in ways that they can't do in the mainstream media. They've been able to cut their teeth on issues and have understood uh, certainly in my situation, the legal ramifications of going too far at some point. But no, 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 no. Uh, but it's, um, it has allowed, I think, for uh, the kind of diverse opinion that we have in our uh, media today. I think that student unionism without student media would be a, would be, would be a major negative in this country.
a very colourful description about the active cultural lack of it. Uh, yes. At the Hill Creek campus. Uh, and I won't ask what, what flavour the yogurt you're referring to. But um, my question really is around whether you are saying that that's because of voluntary student Absolutely. membership. Absolutely. Or, 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 I was going to interrupt and say that there was Greek yogurt. And it has a similar economic result. <laughs> campuses that have currently got compulsory membership, but also suffer from that. Look, I, I think that it doesn't help. I think that we have a culture where the um, citizen is viewed simply as a consumer. They're no longer seen as citizens getting an education. They're seen as citizens, uh, consumers buying an education. And so that change in focus on campuses and, and, and our culture makes, I think, um, it more important than ever that we have that kind of solidarity that unionism actually brings about because you are fighting against a, a tide of, I think, selfishness as a virtue in our society. And I think that what student unionism provides is a conscience of that society. I think it's wonderful. Concerns um, with the bill. First of all, is the clause one, the title, the dual title. I, I like the concept of, of a dual title, but it would mean a lot more and not be seen as merely tokenism if the entire bill itself was Te Reo Māori and also English. Other substantial pieces of legislation uh, concerning no interest, especially perhaps, ought to be looked at in the same way. Clause 7, the interpretation, um, especially the common marine and coastal area, uh, it means marine and coastal area other than specified freehold land located in that area. That's in the bill at the moment. What this does effectively is preempts and defines uh, the what Maori interests are, contrary to what is to come, to come in the Act, and indeed uh, you could look through to Clause 121, which more or less says it is the same thing as the public portion on Seabed and the old uh, 2004 portion on Seabed Act. So it is very similar in that respect, and um, that is a bad thing. I do agree with some of the dock provisions, although it does go too far, I think, as far as uh, defining the dock areas, the Conservation Act, 1987 National Park uh, and Reserves, and so forth, Reserves Act 1977 Wildlife Management Areas. Uh, defining that in the very uh, in the interpretation section as being outside of what is the so-called common, common marine and coastal area. Um, and that links to the customary marine type area, which is defined as being in the common area. It's the same thing as the public part of the Portion on Seabed Act 2004. It prescribes the area and is prejudicial to it. So I reject that. Uh, and it's sad to see that in there. And it was also very sad, um, getting towards the exclusivity test, to see that um, there was a supplementary order paper of Clause 60. Uh, to put in this um, anything other than I think it was the use of where was it the use of uh, navigation and uh, fishing rights over the area. That is the same act. That is basically the same provision as section uh, 32, 32 7 of the old 2004 act, which basically means. I know it's saying not necessarily, but what it sets up to do is saying, well, everything other than navigation rights, or and in this case, this new bill, uh, and fishing rights, means that um, this area is, is now, it's an open question as to whether exclusivity has been um, held over that area. And what that gets down to is, to use um, the Attorney General's example of sandcastles, well, sandcastles aren't uh, navigation and they're not um, fishing rights. So therefore, perhaps, 
under this cell, the building of a sandcastle, is an act that has extinguished Maori interests. And when we get into these little def- tricky little definitions of the exclusivity test, that's where the heat comes on, and that is basically what is unfair and uh, racist about it. Because basically, when it all comes down to what being right, it is white man's touch. It is terra nullius. It is what is being performed here. It is uh, basically an anti marbo act sort of a thing to do. To define things out of existence by one party against the other unilaterally. And I totally reject that. Um, title needs to be investigated in a neutral basis as possible. And as far as claims go, there are claims from one side and claims from another. Some before 1840, others after, but they ought to be the same sort of thing. For example, the abandonment provisions in the structures under this uh, new bill, um, that's very favourable to people who have erected structures after 1840, but why is the same sort of provisions being carried out for Maori interests? Maori always faced the higher hurdle, and that's a fact, and a lot of the um, preemptive so-called issuance and allocation of rights by the Crown um, supersede all the Maori interests, and that is something that um, is supposedly addressed here, but actually, if you look at the detail, is the best solution would be to split the bill between sections that were 7, 8, 9 in the the Portal Sea Bed Act 2004, but I think they correspond to some like um, sections 37, 38, 39 of this bill about public access uh, and navigation and to a lesser extent fisheries. That ought to be split from the bill, that ought to be passed first, it ought to be fairly universal. I think there would be a high degree of consensus, and uh, my idea would be that point of neutrality as regards the title status over all portion of the CB so that you can have public access across the whole title. There's no presumption of trespass unless it is lawfully, physically enclosed, unless it is a private structure in use, unless it is a defence area and very specific examples. But the presumption, and this goes back to the, the, the interpretation at the very beginning of the common marine area, is that freehold title is excluded. Now, I don't think it should be for public access. And indeed, if you look at the Portia Receipt Act 2004, it, it doesn't apply to navigation. It doesn't apply to navigation, but it does apply to public access, which is the truth part issue. So I think it can be universal, and I think those three elements, access, uh, navigation, and to a lesser extent, fishery, slash recreational interest, ought to be dealt with separated from the bill and put through a separate act and passed first. And I think that would perhaps uh, dampen the political slash racial animosity that may exist in some quarters. Uh, and then we can deal with the heavy duty issues uh, like, like title, title allocation um, and the exclusivity tests. Another issue that hasn't been mentioned is uh, the interface of the public access of and the, the abundance of land and access, which is the portages. Now, we've got uh, many portages here in Auckland. We're only a, a kilometre or so from the, the Otahuhu portage. Um, there's been very much neglected and preempted by motorways on one side, railways on the other. I went there last year to try and find where it was. There was a Canal Act passed in 1908, I think it was, to reserve land that goes through there for potentially building a canal. But what it also does, is it acknowledges that there is also a public route which has been used for centuries on centuries and is a public access route established not by the Crown but by Māori and has been acknowledged by the Crown. Now that land at the moment, for example, has been taken over St John's on one side, same with a foe on the other side, a demolition company and has been hopped off and privatised, so on and so forth, preemptively. So there's issues around... Um, Portages as well ought to be looked at. And finally, <coughs> I'd say that uh, the Waterways Authorities, Waikato River Authority, and the other authority north of the Hooker Falls, I think it was, that uh, Parliament passed recently, maybe looked at as something of a template. For the inland waterways, maybe uh, Waitamata, Tamaki River, Monaco, 
can have set of titles perhaps and have different <coughs> acknowledgement of mana whenua, but could be taken and administered singly um, with the cooperation of the new Auckland Council as a way to uh, further amplify and reconstitute to a large degree mana whenua when they have recognised. Thank you, Tim. I think some of the legislation has got, gone the other way around, and I think it goes back to the Ngāti Aka case, I suppose, about uh, having to pass, or well, the Labour government having seen as though they had to pass the Portion and Seabed Act confiscation in order to affect the, um, the later legislation, the Māori Commercial Fishery Settlement, and on the other side, the, the Agricultural Reform Act. And, I, and I, the trouble is, I'm, we're seeing the same thing now because we've got uh, agricultural reform in front of the house, and I know it's another bill, and we can't comment on it or whatever. All I'm saying is that there's a 20% allocation put in there, which infers that Maori interests at least have to accept a perhaps 80% confiscation on the other side, and that's that's the legislation that's running parallel here. It's running in concert, but it's the other way around. We really ought to pass those. Um, public access, navigation, and to a lesser extent fishing slash recreational rights first to get that established, and then perhaps um, do it properly, would be my suggestion. Is it the court still needs some sort of guidance, one way or the other? Because at the moment, what they like to do is open the case books from Canada and from so-called similar colonial jurisdictions, as opposed to going to perhaps Samoa or, or, or Tonga, or other places to get their law from and to inform the discussion in the Polynesian sense about what century-old property rights are all about. Not necessarily, or that are acknowledged by common law. So I think it probably falls upon Parliament to legislate at any rate. To clean things up, um, to have the, the assurity that you don't have to keep appealing and appealing and appealing to get to an actual a durable decision. So I think either way, legislation still needs to be passed, but the courts, and I would say the Maori land court, is the right place we took and we can be discussed rather than going to the high court. Uh, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for your submission. Much appreciated. And thanks for giving us your time to come and do it. So much so that we owe 85% of it to foreigners. So we owe 85% of our economy and the overwhelming bulk of it is to foreigners. So no OECD country, so there are 30 countries in the world that are developed economies, no country in the world borrows a bigger percentage of their money from foreigners <coughs> than New Zealand. John Penny Bright, I hope to be seeing you in Parliament after the Botany by-election. Oh, good. Um, I, won't, I won't wish you luck, just Jamie Lee Ross is our guy, and I think we'll do a fabulous job, but you know, we like democracy though. Regarding a grown-up conversation about debt, yeah. Prime Minister, on the 26th of January, I sent you an Official Information Act request asking, on a line-by-line -line accounting basis, could you please provide the detailed information which shows exactly to whom New Zealand has become a... So we build up a lot of debt. From New Zealand's growing indebtedness. And when will I get an answer to my question? Uh, certainly no, I'm not a professional. Um, so you can answer a joke, of course, that comes from your 
from bad. Yeah. yeah, those people put that together. I wouldn't have a clue whether they borrowed any money off them. If they would, they do it at commercial rates. And the reason I'm a shareholder of Bank of America is because I was a very long-term shareholder of Merrill Lynch. When I was in the company, it was very well run, but unfortunately I left it wasn't, and Bank of America bought them when they went broke. Debtor, since national act government came to power in November 2008, and I asked in particular the information which confirms whether or not New Zealand has become indebted to the Bank of America, any subsidiaries of the Bank of America, or any lending institutions of any form which have connections to the Bank of America, I have yet to have an acknowledgement to this request. The reason why I'm asking, Prime Minister, is because according to the Register of Pecuniary Interests, yep. you are a shareholder in the Bank of America, and are you personally profiting?